Bonsoir tout le monde, good evening. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, uh, Geraldine, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm a bit overwhelmed by, by the setting and by the number of people. Well, what I want to start my talk with is to say something about how water governance is actually a very, is facing today a very strange contradiction. On the one hand, water is very high on global agendas. Everybody knows that competition for water is increasing. But on the other, it's ever less clear and straightforward who is responsible for making water decisions or for making water allocation priorities. This is the combined effect of globalization and privatization because of multiple new actors, in particular private actors, invisible and globalizing market mechanisms that come, they become responsible for water allocation, and because of global policy institutes and directives, questions of how to democratically control water decisions and questions about whom to hold accountable to the, for those decisions are becoming ever less transparent and more complex. To add to this contradictory situation, it's also becoming, or let me say it differently, it's, it's not very, there's not very a lot of knowledge about how much water we have and of what quality about how water flows. This is partly because it's very difficult and costly to actually measure this, but it's also because it, the scientific knowledge of water is becoming ever more contested. And this latter phenomenon is the result of what, could say, what, what, what you could call a changing science-society interface. In the past, all was quite clear. Scientists and engineers were the ones who would speak truth to power, and they would tell policymakers what to do. Right now, that many would agree that science and society and science and politics have become entangled in ways that are in, in very complex ways. So attempts to think about these entanglements and their implications are producing, are really shattering ideas about what water knowledge and what water science is. And they're producing new definitions of new ontologies of water, but they're also producing new proposals about how to produce water knowledge. Water scholars, for instance, propose terms like waterscapes, hydrosocial networks, or hydrosocial cycles to express that the growing pressures on water resources as well as the resulting scarcities, are not natural processes, but the outcome of specific histories and practices of water resources exploitation and development. Water scarcities, in other words, are the outcome of specific societal dealings with watery natures. So in sum, while water questions are ever more urgent, there is less certainty than there used to be about how best how to best know and intervene in water. This is why new ways of organizing knowledge production are called for, just as new ways of organizing water decision making. In particular, at least what is the closest to my heart in, in producing these new ways of organizing knowledge and decision making, is that new modes of engaging with water need to acknowledge and appreciate rather than conceal that water governance is always deeply political. This is the larger question that I and my colleagues at the Water Governance Group in UNESCO IHE and University of Amsterdam are dealing with. This is the definition we are using. We define water governance as the practices of coordination and decision making between different actors around contested water distributions. Such practices are thick with politics and culture. They are linked to creative processes of imagining and producing collective environmental futures. And they combine political problems of scale, spatial, ecological, administrative, temporal, with problems of coherence. 
the dur durable alignment of different people and different waters, despite of problems of incommensurability and political tension. Rather than normatively prescribing how water distribution should happen, and instead of assuming that well-functioning decision-making structures are in place, this definition makes questions about the what, how, and why of water distributions the very center of the study of water governance. This, we think, is useful because it opens them up for questioning and debate. How do distributions happen? Through which technological, institutional, and organizational arrangements? And how are and can they be known, made intelligible? My colleagues and myself, we, we think that ethnographic accounts of everyday governance practices provide a useful empirical basis from which to start answering such questions. A focus on practices entails dealing with the activities, doings, or performances of those involved in the mundane, everyday activities of making water decisions, of coordinating water flows. Here we built on an emerging body of work on practice-based governance, which proposes learning about governance through detailed studies of the messy, heterogeneous, and worldly encounters through and in which water decisions come about and are contested or justified. Allow me to give some examples some stories about water distributions. The water governance questions that I am currently trying to make sense of in my own research. Many of those deal with the transfers of water that are taking place in many rural areas of the world, from lower value food crops to higher value commercial crops or other higher, higher priority users, such as industries and cities. Such transfers are actively promoted in attempts to improve the productivity and efficiency of water used in agriculture, or to save, conserve water, to either quench the thirst of growing cities and industries, or protect ecosystems. Such transfers are made legally possible through the drastic reformulation of water rights, and justified by the dubious characterization of existing rural water users as inefficient or wasteful. Mike, the questions I, I'm asking is, how can we understand these transfers, these reallocations? How do they happen? And what do they mean for the possibilities of dif different groups of people to make a living, accumulate wealth, or indeed develop? Different studies suggest different scenarios. The picture on the slide is a picture of the Yanacocha gold mine in Peru. The story I'm going to tell is the story that is based on a research done by one of the PhD students I'm working with. Her name is Milagro Sosa. When looking at this, this mining company, on the face of it, it appears to be an almost classical case of accumulation by dispossession and proletarization, with highland subsistence, subsistence farmers selling their land and water to the mining company to themselves become agriculture, uh, mining laborers. Although employment is insecure, wages often are higher than what they would have earned as campesinos. They also receive for what are for them very high prices for the water and the land. In addition, the mining company is making huge investments in the region, roads, hospitals, schools, etc all appreciated and very positive. So campesino families are happy about this, but at the same time, they're very worried about the changes in the quantities and qualities of water flows that are caused, caused by mining operations. These have generated and continue to, to generate fierce and sometimes violent protests. Yet the possibilities and powers that the campesinos have to hold the mining company accountable to its water actions are very, very limited. This is because they economically depend on the mining company, but it's also because the mining company has become the de facto water manager in the area. How has it gained these powers of control? Through its technological investments in water infrastructure. The physical control of water that these make possible 
form the basis for their managerial control. In addition, formal accountability mechanisms are mainly directed upwards, with the company having to comply with national and international regulations on the basis of technical information, much of which it produces itself, rather than having to explain what it does to the people who experience, directly experience the consequences of their actions. This story, and I could add many others, clearly show that water governance is not neat neatly contained in a watery domain. In Peru, rapid processes of economic growth happen alongside with and partly depend on new modes of accessing and distributing water that are only partly the result of conscious water policies or management decisions and may even go against them. Water decisions occur through often messy, multi-layered and multiple transactions and negotiations in which power, identity and politics are important. What the story also shows is that these decisions occur in complex environments in which numerous social actors strategize with varying degrees of influence and certainty. These actors do not only have widely differing perspectives and interests, but are also drawing on different resources, norms, legal repertoires to articulate, frame, and defend their positions. Acknowledging this prompts modesty in terms of what can be changed or improved and how fast. But it also forces, th forces thinking about governance away from a predominant, rational, and monocentric model of institutions and policies. What the story also does, and what I find troublesome about stories like these, is it raises questions about the organization of accountability. What happens in a situation like the one of the Yanacoche company, where the facto control over water comes to lie with the, with the international company, who seems to be more accountable to their overseas headquarters and the final clients of their products, than to the governments or people in the regions where they operate. Possibilities to influence the behavior of these companies are limited and often ironic. The slide is a slide of the logo of Levi's for waterless jeans. This is the possibilities there are to influence the behavior of these companies. They consist of corporate social responsibility mechanisms and stewardship certificates with standards often set by the dominant, dominant market players themselves. To come back to expertise and knowledge, our proposal for a critical approach to the study of water governance explicitly includes questions about which and whose knowledges matter and count, and on which grounds. The slide represents the world as it would be if, depending on where most uh, science is produced. I find it a worrisome slide. My colleagues often use it to show the importance of the institute that I'm working in, because the institute is working mostly with, with and for students from southern countries. But you could also see it as, hey, what is happening? Does it matter that most of the science that is used to solve environmental problems in the world is produced in very specific places by very specific people? So these are questions about truth, questions about powers of authority, and it, questions also that, that need to acknowledge that ways of knowing and forms of expertise are always part of governance orders. This slide also represents a specific uh, organization of power in the world. It's not innocent. So there's much to say about it, with which I don't have time, but let me just reiterate that the superiority of scientific expertise cannot be taken for granted. It's, it's needed to continuously ask the question why some knowledges carry greater weight and authority than others, and why, for instance, in the case of Yanakocha, is it that so-called scientific measurements of changes in water qualities and quantities carry greater weight in assessing the environmental behavior of the Yanakocha Mining Company than the experiences of the people living these changes. So pastures turning yellow or cows getting
getting sick do not count. So my point is not that companies or scientists are lying. My point is rather that scientific truth also are situated. They come from somewhere, they have a history, and they are linked to people and to interests. And I think this is important when we think about improving ways of doing water governance. So let me end here. Um, what, what, does, what does our focus on ethnographic practices and including no, the critical approach to knowledge, what does it yield in terms of doing better water governance? I think the, the kind of studies we're proposing will yield accounts of the many and diverse ways in which water distributions happen and are done, and, of, and also of the many different ways they can be known and understood. Sometimes these differences will overlap and there will be resonances, but also sometimes they will conflict. I propose being very explicit and very pragmatic about the negotiations and struggles that are needed to know and deal with water. New modes of knowing and intervening in water can no longer be based on confident finalities and masterful knowing, but instead require modes of engagement that are modest, reflexive, and open to unpredictabilities, contingencies, and the limits of understanding. Thank you.